I have probably the most successful producer that Australia has. Thank you. Um, let me just go through a few of this. Jerry's Girls, Big River, The King and I, South Pacific, Hello Dolly, Secret Garden, Smoky Joe's Cafe, The Venetian Twins, Cabaret, Crazy For You, Annie the Producers, Priscilla, Phantom, Funny Thing Happened On The Way To The Forum, Wizard Of Oz, Footloose, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Dr. Zhivago, We Get Fame, Chicago. Don't check this out because this isn't all of them. No, that's right. This is just a little bit. <laughs> this is just a bit. You've had plays on the West End, Blythe Spirit with Angela Lansbury, mm -hmm. Driving Miss Daisy on Broadway, An Idol Husband, Lady Windermere's Fan, Night Mother, Art. Yes. Mm -hmm. Calendar Girls and Inspector Calls. You had uh, Arena Spectaculars. You had a lot of success with Greece mm -hmm. and other things as well. But you've actually worked with people like Vanessa Redgrave, Julie Andrews, Jill Perryman, Tom Conti, Anthony Waller, Craig McLaughlin, Jeffrey Rush, Patty Lapone, Lisa McCune, Tina Arena, Mandy Patinkin, Angela Lansbury, James Earl Jones, and Debbie Reynolds. That's right. Don't you love Debbie Reynolds? Yeah, she's great. I met her when I was very young. Oh, she's. You, you should meet her now. Why? She's just wild. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you don't have to get up early the next morning. All oh, right. right. <laughs> now, there, there is a famous story mm. uh, that's been retold mm. many times about mm. you starting as a dresser. I did. I was for, for a big company called J.C. Williamson's, which were a bit like the Schubert organisation. They, they owned theatres and they threw out Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. And some, many, many 110 years ago, they owned a few theatres in London. But they were the big management group. And I left school when I was 15 because I wasn't very good at school mm. so I just got out and I ran away with the theatre and the first show I worked on was a big musical called Maine which starred an American star over here which was a replica of the Broadway Broadway Angela like yeah and uh, it's, it was a lady called Gailey Byrne who has never been seen off since since 1968-69 when she toured Australia so I became a dresser and I had to dress all the um, the chorus boys mm. and in those days you had dancers and you had singers, singers which was great you know and the companies were 40 50 big and you know, people people mm -hmm. and so um, I, that, I was thrown in the deep end so you know lots of screaming boys running around yelling at me because I left their trousers in the dressing room <laughs> or picked up one boot instead of two boots so I'm surprised so they never got the sack. It turns out you're a much better producer than dresser. Yeah, yeah, I thought I was a pretty good dresser. They were just difficult. <laughs> Actors. Actors. <laughs> um, but what, I'm, what I wonder is, so that you, you, I read that you looked on and saw these guys in suits. Oh, yeah, through. yeah. Yeah, well, and I always used to see, see because these people, these, these people in grey suits would come backstage and they'd go into the number one or number two dressing room to see the stars of the show. And I used to think, now I'm only 15, to think, what, what do they do? What, what are, are they, they doing? What are they doing? <laughs> these insurance brokers or whatever they were. And they were the producers and I thought, then I found out what producers do and then I thought one day when I grow up, I'm gonna be one of those guys so, and I'll do it better. So when did you, when, well, going forward from that 15 year old mm. child, when did you actually turn around and think, I think I've done this, I think I am, I think I'm. Oh God, that wasn't for another, God, I must have been in my early 30s then when I, um, when I decided I was going to be a producer, and we put this company together called the Gordon Frost Organisation, mm -hmm. which was uh, Ashley Gordon mm -hmm. and John Frost. And I always love when people ring up and say, I saw Gordon the other night, and Gordon <laughs> said, he's a good friend of mine, Gordon, and Gordon said I could have two comps to the show. Yes. And of course they ring here and they say, well, Gordon died in 1989, oh, or whenever yeah. Ashley died, you yes. know. So <laughs> they have no idea, so we can whittle them out a bit. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I remember when you were producing Phantom of the Opera, mm -hmm. and you said to me in a private conversation mm -hmm. that you never thought you would be producing Phantom of the Opera, primarily because Cameron McIntosh would always produce his well, own. Well that's, useful. well, that's right. And it, well, it was a great opportunity because I, to work with Andrew Lloyd Webber's company and um, and to be asked, you know, did I want to be a part of it for the second Australian tour? Yeah. And no, it was sort of furthest from my mind. And of course, it was a big success. Yes. And you were mainly featured and you left us, yes. didn't you? You yeah. did the first two I seasons, yeah, I, did, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. But, are there any other shows or any other people you worked with here where you thought, I never thought I would be doing no, I, I never thought I would be working oh with God, you. Oh God, look, can I tell you, I've never, every day I wake up 
and I pinch myself, and I, I know this sounds cliche, but I pinch myself saying, I'm going to work today to have some fun, and I'm gonna play the role of a producer. So, and I knew you were coming in, so that's why I wore this jacket. So I thought, okay. So you're not a producer, you're just a really good actor. Yeah, that's right, just fake my way through. God, God help anybody find out that I'm not. But, but I wake up and I do, I never thought I'd work with Angela Lansbury, James L. Jones, Debbie Reynolds, and all those people that you, you ran off, you know, and, and a lot of them, you know, I still am in constant contact with yeah. on a personal level. And uh, no, I never thought that. And I never thought that I'd be producing, you know, three to four major musicals a year here in Australia, let alone being involved with shows on Broadway and sometimes in London and that. No, that was the furthest thing from, I was, no, from a kid that left school at 15. No, you don't, that doesn't happen. You dream it. Mm. And uh, that's all wonderful, and you know, and the opportunity to you know receive two Tony Awards for stuff that I've done, and that was was that your proudest moment? Oh God, without a doubt. You know, when we took the King and I uh, to New York in the mid '90s, and you know, when they yelled, said, you know, the King and I wins best best revival of 1994 or whatever it was, was like unbelievable. The thought of going up there at the you know walking on stage at the Majestic Theatre, and that's where they held them, not mm. Radio City in those days, and to receive this award with, mind you, another 500 producers behind me, but it was, and I just stood there and I just pinched myself and I looked around at the curtain call and we were all asked to come up and there was Liza Minnelli, there was every, like it was extraordinary. Yeah. And I'm going, this just does not. Did that make work. life easier for you? Oh, gosh, yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, I think that, that, that Certainly, the Americans start to take you more seriously, and it precedes you. I guess correct. Yeah, and certainly here in Australia, you know, and I, I beat the drum about that award over here in Australia quite a lot in those when, days. When Australians are not good at really celebrating our own overseas. No, they're not. We, they're, it's the tall poppy thing. I think. Yeah, Some, yeah, something about. I know, it. and I think that you know, I've, I've left that now. Yes. I just play my own game and my own thing and get on with it. You are now in the process of um, developing a musical called the uh, the dream. What's it called? Dream Lover. Dream Lover. Yeah, the Bobby Darren story. Yeah, the Bobby. Now Darren there's story. been a little bit of criticism about Georgie Girl. People love it, mm. but one criticism is that unfortunately no one in that crowd had a very dramatic life, and it's a bit hard mm. to do a, a, a thorough story mm. about something mm. where you know Bobby Darren's a bit different, isn't he? Yeah. Well, he, he was a guy that went at the age of eight or nine overheard his mother talking to a doctor, his, his doctor that visited him, and, were, and the doctor basically said this boy's probably got another two or three years to live, and mm. he never heard that. Mm. And he then decided that he was going to live every day mm. as a, a new day and as, as, as a special part of his life. And then he, as, he, as he went on, you know, he found out that his father was part of the, uh, the, the mobsters, and that, you know, that his mother wasn't his true mother. And you know, it's a, all good fun oh, for a really great musical. Good, but it's a great book. It's yeah. a great story. And he dies at thirty-eight. You know, and he was a big he was a, icon, pop a icon, big star. Yeah, and yeah. a great singer. Correct. What's the hardest thing about developing a new show? The single thing that you got to make sure you do properly. It's got to be the book. Yeah, particularly. I've always thought. That. Yeah, I think it's really got to be the book. And then the music will follow. Now the thing with the Bobby Darren musical, it's so you don't have to worry about the music. No, because it's there. And I hate using that term jukebox musical, but it is in a way. Mm. You know, we will blatantly play all those hits and, and work it in. And, and it's been a show that's been workshopped for the last five or six years. We've mm. done two workshops with it now, mm. so we think we're ready to get it up on its feet and move forward. My fair lady. Yeah. What meeting? was there where someone said why don't we get Julie Andrews to direct well who did that th it is an interesting story I toured her doing her chat yes. show sort of thing yeah. around Australia yeah. which was highly successful yeah anyway so I got to know her quite well and and uh, she, apparently she's a darling she's a sweetheart she's everything that you wanted and to be more. and more yeah that's right <laughs> you've heard me say I've, this no no, no I haven't I've spoken to other people right mm. uh, anyway um, I've always wanted to produce my fit lady, but I've always wanted to, to recreate the original 1956 production. Because? Because my mother went to Melbourne from Adelaide, because I'm from Adelaide originally, mm. which is about a thousand miles from Melbourne, another city, 
by bus to see My Fair Lady when it came to Australia in 1959. And I remember her bringing back the souvenir program. So whatever young age I was, I remember looking through that program, and I've still got it at home somewhere, looking at all the photographs, thinking one day, mm. I'd love to be involved with this or in this or something. And as I got older and smarter and decided, I thought, okay, I want to do the King and I, and I want to do My Fair Lady, but I want 56, but because I want the Cecil Beaton costumes and I want the Oliver Smith set designs and the two revolves, everything that made it famous on Broadway, at Drury Lane in London and in Australia. So the idea came up about doing it and I uh, spoke to my friends at Opera Australia and we said, let's see if we can get the Opera House, but we do it with all, uh, not opera singers, but we do it with musical theatre performers. Yep. Um, and we tracked down uh, the people that owned, that, that inherited the designs for the Oliver, Oliver Smith sets. We tracked down the man that was uh, one of uh, Cecil Beaton's last assistants. He had all the original designs. So we're now recreating all those designs as they were, or what we think they were. And the set, everything is just all ready to go now. So it's being built as we speak. And then the idea of Julie came up where it was discussed on the tour. It was like, I don't think it was one of those nights that after a concert, mm. we're all sitting around having a good old having a martini, yeah. Yeah, a, um, uh, you know, kettle one martini with an olive. And, and Julie had gone to bed. I remember that. And I was talking to her, her manager, Steve Sauer. He's a great guy, American. And something came up about you know would would julie ever entertain entertain directing a big musical because she directed the boyfriend mm -hmm. at good speed uh in the states and he said well let's ask it so after about six months of yes it could happen may not do whatever whatever she wanted to decide and she said yes so i can't i can't for the life of me imagine what it would be like for all those people stepping in to do an audition for julie andrews it was extraordinary people were crying before they walked, walked into the room they were so in awe and i have to say it is she has that presence when you meet her you it's just so go, lovely that people want oh, to react that way. i know and some of the hardest nosed Thespians but would, you know that, that I know <laughs> that would come in and you know audition for Mrs. Pierce or one of those other roles and come out and they'd just be the gog, a gog, they melted, <laughs> and it was like it was wonderful. And I've got to say, she was extraordinary in the in the audition. I thing, believe because so. she spent a lot of time with people, and even in those auditions, I noticed that maybe there was somebody that she didn't think was right for the role. Right when they walked in, they started. You, you, you know, if they're not right, even if it might be an ensemble member or a, a principal or whatever. But she still went through the time with them to let them do their number, have a conversation with them, and then say, "Let's try it again another way." So she actually went out of her way. So it wasn't like next one in. There's none of that. No. One of the hottest shows on Broadway, the Book of Mormon. Runaway hit. The creators of South. You would be well advised to book your reservations now. A huge smash success spreading across the country. And now the Book of Mormon has opened in London's West End. You are going to be producing. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm one of the producers yeah. with um, uh, our, our American co-producers. And that opens next year in Melbourne, which is great. Isn't it a great show? It's a fantastic show. I think it's so I, healthy to yeah, have a show like that I do, in I a do world too. like the one we live we, in. We live in now with all the sort of restrictions. But yeah. it is, uh, the auditions have been fantastic here mm. in Australia. And um, it's such a talented, creative team. And mm. I think that this is really going to, as it has done in London and has it's it done still, in the States. I mean, just, how long has it been running in London? Two or three years? Yeah, sold out every night. Yeah, it's, it's mm. the ticket still. Mm. Yeah. That along with Matilda. Yeah. So. All, all bodes well. You've said that your uh, career has been a gamble. What did you mean by that? Look, people say to me, oh, you know, you, do, do you like gambling? You know, and I go, no, I don't. I don't go to the casino and I don't play cards. I don't do any of that sort of stuff. But I think every business venture I go into in theatre, certainly every production is a gamble. Mm. It's a roll of the dice. Mm. And I think it's people sort of say, oh, well, then, no, there must be a way that you know if a show is a hit or a show isn't. There isn't. Because if there was, you'd do it. If there was, <laughs> I'd be on the, I'd have my own yacht 
saying the be words. Rich. Exactly. <laughs> like, you know, I wouldn't have, would, that's what I'd be doing. But I probably wouldn't because I, I you know, and then people sort of say, oh, are we going to retire? No, I'm not going to retire. I'll do this until I, I drop. I may not do four or five shows a year. I might do one every 18 months, but who knows? Mm. You know? The great thing about you, John, um, mm. is that everyone says that you haven't changed in all the years. You're still very approachable. Yeah. And I get a feeling that you, and uh, uh, it's confirmed by this interview, mm. you just love theatre. Yeah, I do. I, I live and breathe it. Yeah. And, you know, there's not enough walls at, at my home to put all the crap I've got framed and paste. Is that your superannuation? Yes, exactly. No one will want it. Go on, eBay. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much for talking with Thank us. Thank you very much.